Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. And I'm excited for uh, service today. Uh, you know, we've been in this series uh, for a while and I've been really enjoying it. Um, but I want to welcome you to Known. And if you're new, I'm Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here. And it's an honor uh, that you're joining us today. Again, whether you're joining us here in house or maybe you're joining us online, it's an honor that you are here uh, with us today. And in this series we've been going through, it's called The Locked Door. And we're going through, as we talk about every week, some of the things that we lock ourselves behind. And the next one I want to go through is this one, locked in apathy. And I actually have a couple of uh, jokes that I found on apathy. And one is, uh, uh, what's worth, worse than ignorance or apathy? As the answer is, I don't know, I don't care. Right? <laughs> or I started writing a book about apathy once and I couldn't be bothered finishing it. Those are funny jokes, all right? Uh, but man, I, I think apathy is something that is part, really a part of our culture, but I think it's also trying to creep into the church. This, this mindset, because uh, you know, apathy is defined as a lack of feeling or emotion, impassiveness, lack of interest or concern or indifference, where for some people, when it comes to our faith in Jesus, when it comes to our walk with Jesus, when it comes to our faith, we're in this place, some of us, where it's kind of apathetic. It's not, we're not, pe- uh, our faith isn't filled with action. It's almost filled with apathy in this, in this space of, we just kind of go through the motions, but we don't actually step into the fullness of what God has for us as we follow him. This, this idea of we're just kind of indifferent to it. We're not really people of devotion. We're not really people of action. We just kind of go through the motions when it comes to our faith. And I believe that some of us, we've locked ourselves behind this door because we're kind of maybe scared or nervous about fully giving the entirety of who we are to him. Because that can be a scary place to be where we actually trust God with our entire future and we trust him that when he calls us to something, we're actually going to step forward and he's going to take care of us along the way. It can be scary to take a step of faith. And I think why I'm enjoying this series is because I think each one of these of these kind of attitudes we have that we lock ourselves behind, it's gonna take a step of faith. It's gonna take courage to unlock the door and step out into oftentimes the unknown. We take a step and we don't even sometimes know where it's going. So how do we move from a place of apathy uh, to action? And I think it's devotion. I think we need to be people of devotion. And we sang this song, we sang, uh, all my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been so good to me, yet I look at my life and how many times have I not been faithful? How many times in my life have I not been good? God pours out his goodness and yet I respond oftentimes not in a way of goodness or faithfulness. I sometimes have a lack of faith and my prayers, I pray for these messages as I pray that God will speak. I'm praying that God will, will help me step out in faith as well because I know how hard it can be. And so what I wanna do is I'm gonna go through the story of Jonah together today. Um, Jonah... It's kind of a remarkable story. It's a story that we probably know. Like maybe you've heard the story of Jonah, you know, throughout your life. And there's so much in this story that I think is so powerful and so important. And and it starts here. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 says this. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. So the story starts in a moment where God calls Jonah to something. He calls him to go to Nineveh and share God's judgment to the city. Now, this is a tough call to get. 
This is a call where Jonah, maybe he wakes up one day and goes like, go to Nineveh. They're horrible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy all of them. Go tell them that I'm coming and my judgment is coming. He didn't like the call very much. You know, Jonah didn't enjoy this call. You're called to go speak judgment over an entire evil city. And God says, I'm go, but I'll go with you. I'll be with you wherever you go. So what did Jonah do? I think he did oftentimes what we do when God calls us or God asks us to do something. God asks us to forgive. God asks us to start caring. God asks us to start being being people of devotion. What do we often do? Well, here, right here. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish and he bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. This is this, is this moment where he gets the call. Go to Nineveh, share the judgment. I'm with you wherever you go. Jonah's like, I don't think so. I love how it says, he tried, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing in the opposite direction. And I was researching this. These cities are like 2,500 kilometers apart. Like he's like, you want me to go to Nineveh? Yeah, right. I'm going literally the opposite way. But I, when I read this story, I often see myself as Jonah in the sense of, again, when God asks me to do something, God calls me to do something, God calls us, if you read through the scripture, to love, or he calls us to forgive, or he calls us to not have this human anger, yet how many times... Do I go the opposite direction? Even when the Bible is filled with scriptures and moments where we're supposed to love the church, the bride of Christ, we're supposed to love Jesus, we're supposed to love one another, yet I think some of us were sitting back in this apathetic state of saying, I couldn't really care less. And it's not for me. It's not a, it's, it's, it's. you know, I'm not going to do that. that. That seems hard. Like, it seems hard that, that when my, when, when, that I got to forgive my dad. Like, I don't know if I can do that. It's not easy when God has called us to do something. See, Jonah says, I'm out of here, God. Like, yeah, right. Like, I'm going the opposite way. You've got the wrong guy. You've got the wrong person. Call someone else. I'm going on vacation to Tarshish. See you later. I'm going somewhere where you can't find me, God, right? Like, I'm, I'm out of here. I have no interest in Nineveh. It's not for me, to be honest. I don't really like the people. I could care less about this mission. This, this isn't for me. I'm devoted to you, kind of, but not that much. I, I care about you, but not, like, not that much. I kind of want to be comfortable. I kind of want to stay in my own way, in my own space. I don't really want to go. It seems hard, so I'm not doing that. Kind of this apathetic attitude that kind of builds up inside of him. And again, I think this is an attitude that has started to cripple the local church. I think especially here in North America, we've become so apathetic, I think, towards the call of God, even the Great Commission, to go and make disciples. This call that Jesus gave us, one of the final things he said on earth, when was the last time I got up and I went? I went and actually shared the gospel or shared Jesus with someone on the street. The call to go, yet a lot of us were waiting. The call to go, yet a lot of us were sitting and we're like, God, it's for someone else. I'm indifferent. I'm a little, like, someone else will do it. And I often hear stories, and I'm sure you have too, of people who follow Jesus out of tradition and out of religion or out of tradition in their family, out of heritage, Rather than actually being fully devoted followers of Jesus, like we learn about and we read about in the scriptures, because it's so easy. We kind of want this watered down Christianity, one that's all about us, about our comfort level, about our energy level, about how I feel, about what I want. It's, all, it's, it's almost some ways become about us, what, what, what's best for me. And if it isn't comfortable, if it isn't how I like it, if things change, if things are different than they used to be, that's it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm tapping out. Like, like, I don't want it to be uncomfortable. Yet I think the reality of following Jesus is that it is an adventure, and it is this space where there's going to be things that God calls us to do that are not going to be easy. 
There's gonna be things that God calls me to do and calls you to do. And it might not be going to a city to declare the judgment of God. It might be literally calling your dad and saying, I forgive you. It might be looking at your kids and saying, I'm sorry. It's actually for us to take action and take, take responsibility for the, the things that we need to do. Rather than run away, rather than hide behind the locked door, do we actually care enough about the mission or the call or the things that God has asked us to do? Do I care enough to not just sit back and relax, but to actually step up and get myself into the game? If the call's too big, if it causes me to be afraid, we say, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm running away. It's too much. Call me to something a little bit smaller. Call me to something a little bit easier. Call me to my bed. Call me to eight naps a day. Call me to be the video game master. I don't know if that's a job. I hope so. Like video game master, can you imagine? What's your job? I'm the video game master. Like that'd be kind of cool. You know, we might say things like this. I got too much struggles going on. You don't know the things that have happened to me. You don't know my past. I barely know the scripture. I, I barely pray. I barely read my Bible. I barely know you. How could you call me to something so big when I feel like I barely even know you? See, we need to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. People filled with devotion and filled with discipline to study and pray and filled with a heart for people that God has called us to taking care of the people he's entrusted to us. So where are you when it comes to your devotion? Where are you when it comes to your relationship with the Jesus? You know, maybe you're newer to faith or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time or, or maybe you've been following Jesus and then you left and you're kind of coming back, you're still trying to figure it out. Where are you in this journey of faith, in this journey and relationship with Jesus? See, are we just committed to God on Sunday morning for a couple of hours, but the rest of the week, we act like we don't even know him? That even people at work or our, our kids or our spouses or our friends, they wouldn't even be able to recognize Jesus in us, in us because we've tried to hide him from the people he's called us to. Where is your devotion when it comes to your finances? Where is your devotion when it comes to your money? Do you trust him to take care of you? Where is your devotion when it comes to your time? Do you, do you carve out time in your schedule to study the scriptures and to spend time in, in worship and to spend time praying for your family or praying for our church and praying for our city? Where is your devotion when it comes to your relationships? Do you spend time with other followers of Jesus? Do you spend time growing together? The reality is, is that God will call us oftentimes to do hard things. Things that we don't necessarily want to do. See, Jonah, that's what's it. He's like, I'm not going to Nineveh, sorry. Like, that's not for me. And if you know the rest of the story, it gets even crazier. But he might call you to forgive. He might call you to invite. He might call you to love. He might call you to give. He might call you to faith. He might call you to courage. He might call you to trust him. He might call you to do some of these things. He might call you to let go of anger. He might call you to do something that's uncomfortable. And we have the choice to either choose apathy, the attitude of I don't care, I couldn't be bothered, I have no interest, it's not for me, Seems like it won't be easy. Seem like, like that's a pretty heavy burden to carry. I'm good. Or we can choose devotion. And I believe that a faith built in the quiet speaks volumes in the chaos. A faith that we build in the quiet moments, the faith that we build in the hard moments, it almost seems like it's not worth it some days. It almost seems like, like God, like I'm not receiving anything. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm just doing this out of kind of just what I, I know I should do, but I'm not feeling it. I'm not experiencing it. But I believe that a faith built in the quiet in those moments will speak volumes in the chaos. When chaos comes, we can have a faith that is built to last. That we're built on the solid foundation that when the storms come, we know that we're going to be okay. 
See, Jesus had so many moments where he went away to be by himself to pray, to grow so he could be filled to go out and live out his mission. I'm gonna skip a little ahead in the story. So he gets on the boat and a storm comes and, and their sailors are trying to figure out what's going on. And then they ask him, who's the God you serve? He's like, I serve, you know, the God, the real God. And, the, and then it goes into verse 10 here. The sailors were terrified when they heard this. For he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. And they say, oh, why would you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked them, what should we do to stop this storm? Jonah's immediate thought is, let's, let's throw me into the sea. That's his first response. Like, like, I would think, like, let's turn back. Like, maybe we should change the direction of the ship and start going to Nineveh instead. He's like, throw me overboard. Throw me overboard. Throw me into the sea, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. See, the beauty of this, though, is that Jonah knew God. See, Jonah knew how powerful he was. He knew how important this was, but he just didn't seem to care. He just didn't even seem to care about the call. He didn't seem to care about the mission. He didn't even seem to care that much about his relationship with God. He's like, hey, throw me into the sea. That'll be the end of me. All good. He knew exactly why their lives were in danger. And how often is this us? We know what we're supposed to do. We know where God has called us to go. We know we need to forgive. We know we need to let go. We know we need to have more joy. We know we need more hope. We know we need it. We know we need it. Yet we know and we don't. We don't go. We don't do what we're called to do. And then we wonder why. It's so chaotic around us. Why the storms keep seeming to come over and over again. Why our lives seem to constantly be a mess. And I think sometimes God is trying to protect us from the storm by telling us to go. He say, hey, if you don't move, if you don't call them, if you don't go, things are going to get worse. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to protect you. And sometimes we don't see the future. We don't see the outcome. We don't see what's next, but he does. It's like when God was leading the nation of Israel through, through the desert. It says they were led by a cloud by day and a cloud to protect them from the blistering heat and to guide them and lead them. And if you go outside of that covering, it's going to be dangerous. It's hot. It's the desert. You're probably not going to make it. And then at night, they're led by, by a, a pillar of fire so they can see. They can see what's going on around them. I think oftentimes we go outside the covering of God on our lives and we wonder why things are happening around us. Now, I'm not saying that God causes these things to happen but I think he knows and he wants to protect us oftentimes from them. See, Jonah, he could have prevented the storm in his life. If he would have just gone the right way the first time, if he didn't try and go to the wrong place, if he didn't try, he would have actually never even experienced this storm. But I think he had left the covering of God. He had left, let his apathy take over and he had not let his devotion reign in his life. And if we skip ahead a little bit more in verse 15, then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. I love this part. Now, the Lord had arranged, arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. I don't know what that means exactly. Did he have a conversation with the fish? Like, hey, fish, like, this is what's going to go down. I don't, like, arranged. Anyway, I just love that word. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. So eventually the sailors, they don't know what else to do. Jonah's like, throw me overboard. And they're like, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep fighting the storm. And it keeps getting worse and worse. And then they're like, we got to throw you overboard, man. It's, and, and they're probably like, it's, it was your idea. Remember that. It's not my idea. So they throw, they pick him up and throw him overboard into the raging sea. Immediately the storm ceases, and then a fish comes and swallows Jonah. Now, what a turn of events. What a, what a wild journey 
Jonah had been on for the past, you know, little while. God shows up one day, go to Nineveh. And he's like, no, I'm going to Tarshish. And there's nothing you can do about it. Right? And then God's like, you really think so, Jonah? Like, right? Like, you really think so? Good luck, buddy. And then he's on the, sea, and on the ship, and he's like, oh, boy. The storm's coming. He's like, God, like, I know this is you. And he's like, you know what, guys? Throw me overboard. So he, he, and I'm sure when he's thrown overboard, he probably thought this was the end, right? Like, he probably thought this was the end of his life. And they throw him overboard. Thanks for the memories. And then he's swallowed by a fish. Now, while he's in the fish, there's this prayer he prays. And I think it's very fascinating, very beautiful, um, this prayer that he prays while in the fish. I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. And he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wind and the stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, and I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains, and I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates lock shut forever. And this is where it changes. But you, O oh Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my, near, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for, the, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. This prayer, there's so much depth in it, but I think, you know, when I read this, I think this is sometimes how life feels. It feels like we're sinking beneath the waves. It feels like we can't barely catch our breath before the next thing happens. Or the next emergency or the next problem or the next mountain or the next giant. And we're like, God, like, like I feel like I can barely breathe. I feel like I don't even know if I can keep on going. I think sometimes this, this, this attitude we have of apathy is honestly just because we're weary and we're tired. Why don't we care? Because I'm tired. I feel like even sometimes we feel like our life might even be slipping away. We feel like we're sinking and we, we feel like we're never gonna make it. We feel like it might even be close to the end. But the beauty is every single time the Lord will find you wherever you are. Even if we're at the depths of the ocean or the highest mountain or the deepest valley, he will find us there and rescue us. And that's where our strength comes from. It's not from our own abilities. It's not from our own talents or it's not from our education. It's, it's from Jesus. The strength that he can bring in our hardest moments. The hardest things that we go through. And he says there, thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for your grace. And then, then God calls Jonah again. He calls him, go to the city. Tell them to turn from their ways and to, to no surprise, likely everyone there will decide to turn from their ways. And this, we get to this part of the story. They decide to turn from their ways. And we get this part. It says, when God saw what they had done, and after Jonah tells them, he says, yo, like, like turn from your ways. They're like, you're right. The king takes off his robes, and he, and he, and he starts worshiping God. And, and this is the story. It ends like this. When God saw what they had done, and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind. It did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. This is the victory. And I imagine Jonah being like, man, look at me. Look what we did, God. Right? Like you and me, bro. We did this. And I imagine God like, Jonah, your obedience and your devotion has brought 
life back to the city, brought light back to the city. The king is bowing down and asking for forgiveness. They've realized their mistakes. God has brought justice to these people. He's changed his mind. He's changed his plans. You would think that Jonah would have this exuberant reaction to this. I think he would. Right? I get called by God. I run away. He brings me back to the place I was supposed to be. I shared the story of destruction. They turned from their ways. I'm the hero of Nineveh. Let's put up a statue, right? Look what God did. Look what we did. But this is Jonah's response. And this is very fascinating. The next verse. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah. And he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are merciful. I knew that you were compassionate, God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You were eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Wow. Now, it's almost like he's trying to like roast God, but he's saying beautiful things. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He's angry. This is fascinating, to be honest. Just kill me now. It almost seems like it's come out of the blue. See, I think the part of this is, for Jonah, he didn't have love in his heart for these people. He says he didn't want to go. Why? Because he knew God would rescue them. He's like, you're, you're going to do it anyway. And I don't like that. You're too compassionate. You're too merciful. You're slow to get angry. And you're filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. I don't like that. Let's sick them. Let's get, let's get them. He knew. So he ran away. See, I think the truth about apathy is ap- apathy almost opens the door. More like it closes the door and we start to have like layers of doors. Things that we've locked ourselves behind. Because I think that apathy oftentimes leads us to anger. See, I think we have to be very careful with apathy. Because if we're locked behind apathy, we are in danger of locking ourselves behind many, many doors. See, I think a relationship with Jesus is so much more than just the basics. It's so much more than just tradition. It's so much more than just religion. It's, it's so much more. It's a relationship with the Savior of the world. It's not just coming to church for a couple hours a week. It has to be deep devotion everywhere we go. A devotion that is is enough for us to even pray for our enemies. Devoted enough to actually read and study the scriptures. Devoted enough to serve and devoted enough to give. Devoted enough to go. Devoted enough to share the hope and joy and love and light that we have. Where is our devotion right now? Where are you when it comes to prayer in your life? Where are you when it comes to daily devotion and daily routine? Where are you at when it comes to what you know you're supposed to do? Maybe something God's been asking you to do for years and years. It might even be decades. It might be hours. It might be weeks. It might be days. So God is asking us Maybe it's to work on something in our own life. And we're having this fight or this tension. We're not willing to let go. Where are you when it comes to your devotion and who God has called you to be? See, God has not called us to be apathetic. He's called us to be compassionate and full of love and faithful. That no matter the calling, we're willing to take the step of faith. 
And not just do it because we have to, but because we love to, because we love the growth we're seeing. We love how deep and connected we are with Jesus. She devoted enough to even push past apathy to actually care about what he wants us to do in our lives. To let go of the things we need to let go of and hold on to the things we need to hold on to. So I think Jonah struggled because he knew the truth. He knew how amazing God was. And he wanted his own way. He later goes and sits. He's like, God, I'm out of here. He goes and sits. It just says he's going to sit and just watch what's going to happen. Is he going to destroy the city? I don't know. And then God grows this tree, grows this plant, and it grows, and it offers shade, and then the plant withers and dies, and Jonah's even more angry again. This is what the last verse of Jonah says. It's fascinating. It says, then the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? And that's how it ends. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Up to this point, Nineveh is just known as horrible, vile, evil. I think it just shows the deep love that God has for humanity. That even in our brokenness, even in our fear, even though we maybe have locked ourselves behind some doors, maybe even in a place where we've locked ourselves in apathy and we don't really care, we just kind of go through the motions that God says, I love you. I care. I care that you've been so hurt by the church. I care that the the people that you thought would be there aren't there. I care. I care even though you're digging your own hole. Like I I care even though you're causing all this. I, I care so deeply about you. I care. We gotta learn to care about the things that God cares about to care about the calling on our life. And I'm not talking about, you know, a career or an occupation or an education. I'm talking about the call to go and make disciples, the call to love people that we see, love the people that walk through our doors, the call to not just sit back and watch other people do what he's called us to do, but to actually step up and step out and start loving people and taking care of the widows and the orphans and taking care of the broken among us and loving the people that are really hard to love. We need to care. Care about the people he's entrusted to us. Learn to show compassion and learn to show love to those who desperately need it, like I did and I still do. You know, our takeaway today is this, is the key to unlock the door of apathy is deep devotion. What are you doing every day to draw closer to Jesus? What are you doing every day? What are you doing every morning? Or what are you doing at work? Or what are you doing at night? What are you doing every week to grow your devotion? What are you doing every month? What are you doing every year to grow your devotion? We need to be people of devotion and unlock the door of apathy. And unlock that door. How do we do it? I think we can pray almost a simple prayer and it's a dangerous prayer in some ways but it's this God give me eyes to see and give me ears to hear because when we see it it's hard to be ignorant when we know it's there it's hard to be apathetic when we know the problem and we're and we carry the solution it's almost dangerous because it's saying God all right I'm about to do it give me eyes to see and give me ears to hear we got to learn to see and learn to hear who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do 
and where we're supposed to go. Try to learn to see and learn to hear. God, I thank you. First of all, God, that you do love us. That even though so many times we've locked ourselves behind all these doors and we've tried to be comfortable, you still show up. That even if we feel like we're drowning, we feel like we're sinking, we feel like we can't keep on going, God, you meet us there and you, you do rescue us. And God, I pray that you help us not be people filled with apathy, but God, you help us be people of deep devotion, people of action, people who don't take the call lightly, but people that know, God, you've called us to love. And so that's what we're gonna do. So God, help us be people of devotion. Help us study, help us pray, and help us go where you've called us to go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I'm gonna invite Beth up. She's just gonna close our service quickly. Thanks, Pastor Destin. Um, just as kind of a, a little tack on, I think that prayer, like for my in my own life, if I've been struggling with forgiveness or things like that, you know, a way to change the way that you see that person or that situation is to really pray. When we pray, we we close our eyes and 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 it's almost like when we open them, we we have God's eyes. You know, we are able to see situations for what they are. We're able to, you know, see people and see them as as people who are loved by Jesus and not just people who hurt us. Um, and so, yeah, prayer, prayer is a way that we get our hearts in alignment with God. And so I wanna challenge you, pray for your spouse this week. <laughs> pray for them, pray for your spouse, pray for your kids, pray for your neighbors. <laughs> That's super important. Pray for the people that are surrounding you day to day. Pray for those that have hurt you. That's biblical. We pray for the people that have hurt us. And, and honestly, that has been one of the best ways to combat unforgiveness in my own heart is to just on the daily get my heart in the place where I can say, God, I want what you want for that person. I don't want them to get what they deserve. I want them to get all the things that you have for them. I want them to receive your love. I want them to receive your forgiveness. I want them to receive all the blessings that you have for them, not just the bad things that I want them to get because they hurt me and they deserve it because you know they're awful. No, it really changes it to, I want what God wants for them. And when we pray, our, the view of, of our struggles change. Even the things that we're going through, it, they, they, they get a new light on them. So when we experience the goodness of God, not just for ourselves when we pray, we, we experience the goodness of God for others as well. We don't get caught in our own circumstances. We also get to understand the goodness of God in other people's lives. And honestly, we see the goodness of God when other people can't even see it for themselves. And I think that's a really beautiful place to be. When we can look at somebody's life and say, wow, you don't even know it, but the goodness of God is so rich in your life. You don't even acknowledge him, and yet I can see his goodness in your life. And I think that's a beautiful testimony to be able to share with people too.